reporting them here today. I hope uh, you're all doing okay. Uh, this talk today is going to be about pragmatics. Uh, it's a follow-up to the one we had last week. We're going to review a little bit of what pragmatics in language learning is, how we can implement pragmatic into project-based language learning. I will focus in showing especially different examples of how this can be done and also how it can be done at different levels. And then we'll have some final considerations on um, the issues that are important when we implement or when we decide to focus on matics on PLL. Okay, so just to review a little bit, pragmatics and language learning. The second language pragmatics is the ability to understand and use the target language for a specific purpose in an appropriate way, according to where we are, our physical context, who we are talking to, our interlocutors, the relationships that we have with those interlocutors, if we are familiar with them, if there are any type of power relationships with them, if we don't know them at all, and also the shared norms and knowledge of the behaviors of that participant and us. Do we share uh, knowledge of how things are done in my first language, in their first language, in that specific community of talk, etc.? And we talked a little bit about these being essential because it's part of our linguistic ability, our language competence, and actually because without appropriate language, we really cannot get very far in um, our interaction with others. We need to be appropriate in order to uh, build rapport and maintain our rapport and also to uh, make sure that we accomplish whatever we want to accomplish in that um, interaction. So what happens when we integrate pragmatic in PBLL? How can we do this? Well, we have to remember that the L in PBL is language. Since uh, pragmatics is part of language, we need to think about it as one more component of what we need to target in PBLL. So we, of course, have to look at the linguistic elements, and that's where we tend to focus our projects mostly. So some grammar points, some pronunciation, vocabulary, syntax, of course, the content of the culture. But we also should be focusing on some thematic elements, so cultural behaviors or social norms, interactional conventions, cross-cultural similarities and differences, etc. So let's see some examples and then we can work from there. So what type of projects can we do that incorporate pragmatics? Um, I think that we can really um, do these from many different perspectives, but I think any project should include observation of the cultural norms of the L2 that the students are um, studying. There should be some type of awareness development, that is, this is how the things are done in this language. This is how the language is used in this context. And also we should, uh, the project should help us develop some interactional resources, some ways of really engage in an appropriate and successful conversation with the speakers of the L2. And I think really there can be two different forms of integrating pragmatics into PBL. So one would be to actually focus the entire project on pragmatics, and we'll see some examples. So the whole project would be about some pragmatic item and how um, that affects the language. 
And the other, which is probably what most people are going to do, I think, is to incorporate pragmatics within a project that is focusing on something else. And we'll see some examples of this. So I'm going to recycle something from last week, just as a reinforcement. Um, an idea of a project that incorporates, so not that focus, but that incorporates L2 pragmatics that I presented last week would be, for example, in a project in which we are learning about a cultural holiday in our L2. Uh, part of that project would be to interview members of the community about that cultural holiday. And um, the content, of course, would be to learn about the holiday and to learn uh, enough so that we create interesting questions, understand the answers that we will get from the members of the community. The language could focus on uh, asking questions, how we actually form questions, the vocabulary related to that content, and we will have to work skills such as our pronunciation, our comprehension of auto production, uh, the delivery of these questions, etc. Uh, the 21st century skills that we'll be practicing would be to uh, be able to work in teams, uh, be able to peer critique, to organize our content, and some uses of technology a reporter or a to record these interviews, download the data, transcribe it, analyze it, etc. And then the pragmatic component that we would incorporate within this project would be all of the language and the social norms around the speech act or interview, the act of asking questions. So we would focus on that and what comes before that and after that. So before that, before we can get to the interview, we would actually have to request an interview. So how do we request an interview in a formal way, depending uh, how, uh, who our interlocutors are or a more informal way, if it is maybe members of our family, um, what kind of uh, speech acts do we use to do this? Language is appropriate. How do we introduce ourselves to that person when we need them for the interview? What, not just the language, but what the one nonverbal language it is appropriate for that interlocutor in an introduction setting? And then, of course, how to uh, produce um, the appropriate greetings, the asking of the questions, how do we manage the topic, how do we express thanks, um, also how we understand the conversation in itself, how people take uh, turn takes, how um, actually people overlap or do not overlap, how do we picture who um, can self-select and cannot self-select, in an interview for speaking, for example. Uh, we would need to target also politeness and what are the uh, social norms of politeness in, in the language and what would be the appropriate level of politeness for those interviews. And then we would probably help the students by contrasting uh, not just the language used in both, but also the cultural norms used in both. So something as simple as how do we sit down when we do an interview with someone in different um, languages. So that's an example that we already saw a little bit. And I would like to show you um, another example. And I took this from one of the participants' ideas uh, last week. And this participant uh, uh, suggested as one of his or her ideas uh, to have a two-day baseball camp for Arabic refugees. So I looked at the example and I figured out, well, what pragmatics are important for the students that will be doing this to do it in an appropriate way, in a cultural 
social and linguistic appropriate way. So I um, divided a little bit because I'm not an expert on baseball camps and I'm definitely not uh, an expert on Arabic. I just divided it a little bit into the things that I know are important in any language. So the cultural norms are usually different in languages. So in this case, I could think of, um, well, what, what are the attitudes that Arabic speakers may have towards sports? They may be very different from the ones that we have here in the United States. What about their clothes? What, what kind of clothes they wear? Um, what about their public displays of emotion, for example? Uh, people here, even in different uh, types of sports, people behave differently. Baseball is not famous for a lot of screaming, but if you watch, I don't know, boxing, for example, people get really emotional. Then what are the men and women roles when uh, we do this baseball camp? And how will that be different for the Arabic refugees from the American uh, students? What are the level of politeness that we need to incorporate when playing games, when playing baseball? Maybe the politeness goes the window because you know, what we are thinking here is fast and furious, right? So for these, uh, we would need to definitely uh, look at the content, so how we would target it what content would be different, and then we could easily talk about the similarities and the differences. It could be done through um, a large array of activities, and I'll show you some activities afterwards that could be used for this. We could also look at speech chats. So how are greetings done? How are invitations? How are giving instructions? How are correcting? because we definitely need to give feedback if we're teaching someone to do something like playing baseball. How about asking questions? Who asks the questions? Who has the right to ask and answer questions? How do we disagree and how do, in this case, the Arabic uh, refugees would disagree or would even not disagree with something? So these would be the ones that we could think with this context. So I'm thinking all the speech acts in the world, which are many for different um, activities, but we could think about what speech acts will come out during this activity. And then of course, we will have to look at what is the important language to be able to realize them, the nonverbal language, of course, and also the behavior to how we do these speech acts. You can think of greetings, which is the most um, obvious one. And when we greet each other, there's non language. There's handshaking, kissing, there's no touching, there's um, different ways of nonverbal language. We would also have to look at interactional norms. So not just the cultural norms of how people behave, but also how people speak. So is it okay to scream at each other? Is it okay for the empire to scream at someone else? But is it okay for the player to scream at the empire? We know that's not the case, right? So there are norms of interaction in this type of activity. Is it okay to overlap? Is uh, what kind of nonverbal language is important here? And Baseball uh, loses me because I see people doing all kinds of signs with their hands and I got no clue what they are saying, for example. So I can Im imagine that the Arabic refugees coming here will think, what are they doing with their hands here? Um, and also how people display membership and a stance. Are, um, is it important that they feel a sense of belonging to this activity and that would be displayed? Um, these uh, would be uh, related to the particulars of a conversation. So we could analyze conversations, see how they are done. We could analyze videos, talk about them, and more activities done. And then finally, um, a very, I think, useful way of looking at how incorporating practice into the project is to look at the similarities and the differences in the language that is used during that activity. 
some things may transfer well from one language to the other, and that's what we call positive transfer. While other things, if we do it in the L2, like we do it in the L1, they're a big catastrophe, and those are called negative transfer. So by um, raising a student's awareness about these transfers and how they can be done and which ones we need to put more emphasis in not doing, that can um, teach a lot about pragmatics to students. So this would be if we incorporate pragmatics into an existing or in the one we are thinking and the project that we are thinking. So this project was not mine and I thank the owner of the idea for it. Um, what if the entire project focuses on pragmatics? So after these talks, I am so convinced that it's important that I want uh, my students to actually focus on a project that um, it's about pragmatics. This project focuses on pragmatics, but it's not only about pragmatics, of course. So um, I've uh, already put it in a square so that people can start getting used to these. The problem, question, and challenge of this project would be to help, um, the problem would be that um, some incoming ESL students have a very hard time simulating to the school culture when they enter their school in the new um, place of arrival. This uh, will have a, a, a purpose, looking at this will have the purpose of actually helping uh, students better understand how these different cultures happen in schools. And it could help actually the schools integrate the students with less travel. There will be community partners joining in this project. In this case would be the school administration, the parents and our uh, students in the school. The product that we want to have at the end of this project would be handout to help students understand linguistic landscape and what are the social pragmatic rules of this school. And these would also be shared with the new ESL students, their parents, and um, maybe we could also have a meeting with them to talk about it, etc. And why do students care about this project? Well, I probably they went through the same experience because these would be ESL students themselves. And they probably had a little bit of a hard time for uh, integrating into school. So with this experience, they can facilitate how other students in the future integrate into schools. And they can also help the school, the school become a, a more welcoming place for other people. In this project, uh, we would be doing a lot of observation of linguistic and behaviors in a school. So in a way, we would, be, uh, we would become anthropologists looking in our um, school and see how people talk, where people talk, where people need to talk about what. Uh, what do people talk about in the cafeteria? How do they talk now? How do they talk on the corridors? How do they talk when they're in class, etc., etc.? We would be contrasting and comparing the, the pragmatics of the both the languages. The L2 in this case is English and L1 wherever the students come from. And also interpreting the cultural and pragmatical differences and how we can overcome them. So this project, as you can see, is a lot more about the pragmatics of speaking a new language when you arrive to a new place. So most people would say that pragmatics, uh, um, that uh, PVLL can only be done at intermediate or a higher level. And we get questions all the time about, what about novice, what about novice? We really uh, think that any project can be done at any level, as long as the students are um, scaffolded appropriately, the activities are appropriate for the language level, and let me show you um, three different levels of how 
we could focus on greetings, for example. If greetings are something very different in our L1 and L2, this speech act is something that students are going to do constantly when you meet um, someone else. Greetings are universal. The way we do them are not universal. But the greetings themselves, uh, there is no language, no culture in the world that does not greet someone else. So um, very important, important, important thing to do. So novice, intermediate, and advanced. How we could just target greetings with different types of activities. So if we have a group of uh, novice students, we could focus on the basics of how to be appropriate. So how to conduct a proper greeting, the behavior, what the language is, and how to do that, not just to explain it to the students, but we need to work with it. We need to scaffold the students into being able to do it. So we could do some awareness raising activities, like uh, watch a few greetings um, in interviews. If we want to go back to our project of the interviews, we could talk about the interlocutors, their relationships, the context. We could have some metapragmatic instruction that is explicit uh, explanations of how greetings work and then we could focus on interviews if that is the only thing we want to do and of course we can do practice activities like role plays change roles change context and uh, we can focus on the behavior then we can focus on the language and that way we can scaffold the students into um, doing more uh, difficult things if our students are intermediate, then we can do the same thing that we did for the novice, plus we can add more context, we can do it with more interlocutors, and we can add a few other speech acts. So after greetings, people don't just stop, right? They go into talking to each other, or they go into asking questions, and then we can, we can expand that way. The type of activities would be um, similar, so our racing activities, metapragmatic instruction, and interactional activities. Um, these times we can, for example, watch the videos without the sound and get them to create the dialogues that would be linguistically and cognitively more complex tasks. Uh, we can talk about negative transfer when things don't work. Um, every time I go to Japan, I have to really, really hold myself from hugging and kissing people. So that's because I know that's a very negative transfer. So that metapragmatic instruction really worked well for me. And uh, interactional activities. So students could actually greet each other. Uh, we can send them to greet people in the community. We have community speakers. Uh, we can bring people in the class so that they have to greet someone different. And of course, we can include already more complex speech acts. So after the greeting, maybe an invitation comes or a suggestion or a question and answer. For advanced students, they could do, we could do the novice, we could do the intermediate, and then we could move on into doing things that are more cross-cultural. The advanced students most likely will have more interaction with the speakers of the L2. So they will need to know more about positive and negative transfer. Um, we could also fo focus um, our videos, for example, on miscommunication happenings and why miscommunication happened, how it could be avoided. Uh, metapragmatic instruction can be uh, to, on items that are more difficult to acquire in pragmatics. We know, for example, that uh, implicature is something uh, very difficult to learn in English. Implicature is to know what people mean when they're not saying what they want to say. So, uh, for example, I can enter a room and say, open a window, but I can also enter a room and say, oof, it's hot here, oof, and hope that people will uh, know what I, uh, I mean, what I am implicating. And that was an easy example, but implicature can get 
quite, quite difficult. And it's something that advanced uh, students will encounter very often because native speakers do it all the time. And also some interactional activities uh, like engaging uh, with L2 speakers at different levels in different contexts. If we don't have any uh, speakers around us, uh, things like teletandem, tele telecollaborative projects would be a great uh, source to connect uh, our students with the speakers of the language. And of course, there's a speech acts that are much more complex, like rejections and requests, where we uh, lose face and we need to do a lot more uh, pragmatic work in order to reject something and still not offend the people that uh, we are rejecting from. So these are really appropriate for advanced students. So a few things to consider to finish with. Um, we need to keep in mind that pragmatics are language specific. We cannot cookie cutter one for one language and hope that it will transfer to all of the languages. Um, think for example, the, the pragmatics of gender, how uh, the relationship between how men and women speak in Arabic or in Japanese are much more complex than they are in Spanish or English or German, for example, right? Also, different communities of language uh, use different variations of an L2. Last week, someone comment, um, asked a question about, well, should I teach them the L2 of the capital or should I teach them the L2 of the community that lives around the corner? And I think that has to do with what your project is and what the need of your students are. If your students are only going to talk to the, uh, the speakers of that community, that may be the place where you can start. And then hopefully students will want to travel to other places that speak that language and therefore they will need different variations of that L2. Um, also, some languages employ nonverbal communication more than others. Me, being Spanish, I use my hands a lot. Uh, Italians uh, stereotypically use their uh, um, body a lot more. Uh, but a a a pretty much every language uses embodiment. So if it is not big gestures, there's things like gaze. So do people look at the eyes when they speak? or is that not appropriate? Do you have to actually look down, but listen up, yeah? So all of those things um, happen in all of the different languages in different ways. Now, the same activity may also require different behaviors or different languages. So it's not that greetings are always the same. It depends, of course, who we are greeting, where we are. Even with the same interlocutors, we would greet probably different our boss when we arrive to the office in the morning that if we are meeting for a co-workers birthday party at a bar. So even all of those things are a little bit different. A very typical example is the same speech act, the same activity, which is exchanging a business card. It's very different uh, than in different cultures. We also need to keep in mind that uh, understanding pragmatics is a little bit like understanding grammar. No one is born knowing grammar. Teachers don't know grammar intuitively. Native speakers don't know how to explain grammar to other people. In order to be able to explain grammar, you went through uh, pedagogic training, you study on your own, you looked at ways to explain these things. This is the same with grammar, uh, with uh, pragmatics, I'm sorry. So it is not that intuitively you will know how to explain these things. You really need to work on it the same as you work in how to explain your grammar to your students. So you definitely need training and you definitely need support. And that's what we are here for. And finally, it's important to consider student agency. So students may decide that they really don't want to accept the pragmatics of a certain language. And we have uh, research that shows us that 
Uh, sometimes people decide not to use the norms, even if they know them. And when we know they know them, and when they actually uh, are able to verbalize those norms, they still don't want to use them. Uh, the community may perceive us as foreigners, and therefore they don't want us to totally integrate and use the, the same pragmatic norms that they use among themselves. But even if this is true, it's important to have knowledge of the norms, to know what the norms are, to observe them, to ask, to reflect, and then to decide whether we want to use them or not, but we need to know the consequences of applying or not applying these pragmatic norms. And basically, this is my talk for today. Um, I wanted to make sure that we had a, a few minutes maybe for 